Hello, I'm Erin Archuleta, small business advocate here at Square. Communities around the world are facing unique challenges right now. For business owners, the stakes are particularly high. You may be navigating new situations or making unprecedented changes and decisions. As we get our conversation started today, I want to share that squareup.com has a dedicated resource hub with timely resources for sellers, offering tips and guidance. I'll share this link again at the end of our time together. We're here to help. And in the spirit of that connection, here in our food and beverage town hall, I'm grateful to our speakers who've joined us from all over the United States. Today, we have Jamie Cunningham, founder of Stay Golden in Nashville, Tennessee. Lauren Crabb, owner and founder of Andy Town Coffee in San Francisco, California. Corey Micallo, co-owner of Nito and The Backyard in Oakland, California. Peter Giuliano, Chief Research Officer from the Specialty Coffee Association. And Julie Klaus, District Director at the U.S. Small Business Administration. We're going to kick it off today with Jamie. Thank you for joining us. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about Stay Golden? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Stay Golden is a uh, restaurant and roastery. It's uh, pretty much an all-day cafe here in Nashville. Uh, we opened about 18 months ago and um, kind of have an idea to elevate American diner classics and combine them with specialty coffee as well as um, really a thoughtful bar program here in Nashville. So it's been really fun. <laughs> that's, that's really great. I can't wait to visit. Um, I know in Nashville, you're, you've really been dealing with more than just the coronavirus. Um, the city and its businesses have also been impacted by tornadoes that hit a few weeks back. Um, you and the team at Stay Golden have really responded, and you've been connecting with the community, offering uh, survival packs. And I wonder if you'll share a little bit about what that entails. Yeah, absolutely. So for us, you know, after the tornado hit and then less than a week later with, you know, the federal government and our local governments starting to shut things down for coronavirus, really had to figure out how we were going to continue meeting needs in our, in our community. So we immediately just shifted our focus outward. We stopped promoting things that, um, you know, we would normally be promoting like, hey, here's our new drink or here's a new menu item. And we immediately started figuring out what we, what we could do to make people's lives in our community better during this time. Sure. Um, yeah, so survival packs are really that. You know, we, um, we put together large format coffee beverages, um, large format food offerings. We don't usually offer uh, dinner, but we started having, we, you know, we put together dinner plans for families and for couples. Um, cocktail kits, so everything but the booze with instruction cards that we put together and stuff like that, and just started trying to connect with our audience. So um, that was one way that someone could take the restaurant, you know, uh, into their home or find a way to kind of bring the comforts of going out, um, but have it available inside. And also included in survival kits was pantry staples. So. Mm -hmm. We had access to things that other people didn't have, flour, eggs, toilet paper, um, loaves of bread, you know, things like that. So along with ordering, say, your dinner, you could also throw on a dozen rolls of toilet paper and uh, some local eggs and things like that. So that was the idea behind Survival Packs. Yeah, really like a one-stop shop for family. Yeah. yeah, try to add some convenience as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, you know, thinking about the spread of COVID-19 and how it's impacted your business, um, how have you adapted to really the changes with health regulation or business operation regulation? And what does that look like for you all? Totally. Well, you know, I think this is probably the same for most restaurants that are actually following the health guidelines. You know, we're already very clean establishments. So meeting the new CDC standards or ex really exceeding CDC standards wasn't a far reach for us. But we started doing things that weren't necessarily involved with that. We started um, sanitizing door handles and, and iPad screens and um, stuff like that regularly. Uh, at first it was every hour and then, then it was every 30 minutes. And uh, frankly, at this point, um, it's pretty much 
between every transaction because we don't have a lot of transactions happening inside anymore, right? Um, yeah. One or two a day and the rest of them are curbside and things like that. So uh, we just wanted to help people understand that we are really, really conscientious of how their food's prepared, how, you know, if it's in a to-go bag that we're wearing gloves when we present it and just doing as much as we can to help people know that we're taking this seriously. Yeah, and it sounds like with curbside and some other things, you've sort of changed how you've operated. Um, totally. How are your customers and community responding? Really well. I, I think, um, honestly, a, a lot of our community appreciates the curbside uh, pickup, and they will, I think we'll probably continue doing it. Um, there are a number of things that we've, we've realized through this process that I think are going to change our business permanently. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we might touch on a little bit more of that later. I know that um, certainly I've been hearing from business owners that we're all learning new ways to operate and maybe even some new tricks. So um, I, I'm going to likely ask you about that later. Sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great. Now I'm going to take it to Lauren. Um, Lauren, I'm here in the Bay Area also and can proudly say I'm a regular at Andytown. You're super close to where I live and work. Um, but for folks tuning in, maybe you could share a little bit about your business so they could learn a little bit more about what Andytown is. Hey, Lauren, uh, I believe you might be on mute. Okay, we'll come back to Lauren as she gets her um, audiovisual set. So Corey, also here in the Bay Area, you're in Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd be able to share with our viewers today a little bit about Nito and the backyard. Sure. Um, so Nito has been open for um, almost eight years. Uh, my wife and I opened it. Um, it, used to, it was a laundry mat before that. Um, it's equal parts comfort and elevated Mexican cuisine. Um, it did really well. And five years ago, we looked at um, expanding to um, a new concept that we wanted from day one called the backyard, which is quite literally and figuratively in our backyard. It's a, it's a block and a half away from Nito. Um, and instead of a thousand square feet, it's um, 30,000 square feet. Um, wow. And we just got that open in October and things were um, going very well and until, um, you know, the new world that we live in now. So um, also Mexican, uh, more of a, you know, outdoor party vibe. Um, and so in light of everything that's gone on, we've consolidated restaurants and staffs um, to the backyard because it's uh, more space for the staff more space for uh, customers and we combined crowd favorites of both menus and are doing um, to go curbside delivery etc out of their um, cocktails etc so um, we joke that <clears throat> i guess it was last sunday night we made a or two sunday nights ago we made our schedules for both restaurants and i like hey we're gonna take tables out and downsize the staff but still do full service three meals a day both places and then in 24 hours that became now we're closing one of them consolidating everything and then that changed again so we we've become pros at on the fly uh restaurant creation i think in the last 10 days so i'm sure it will change again yeah that's um that's really helpful context i think that especially around the country different people are experiencing different um, different impacts at, at different times. And so even having a glimpse into that 24 hour turnaround, those little um, changes, those, those make a big impact. Um, so you and the team actually, besides just thinking about the model, you've also been really creative in terms of outreach to customers. You've changed your hours in a way that maybe others haven't yet considered, but you've actually expanded your hours to seven days a week for service um, and, and yeah. our boring delivery and pickup. I'd just be curious to get your feedback on how that's going. Yeah, we, Sylvia and I really gritted our teeth on opening Mondays. That was like a <laughs> 
um, sacred thing for us. And now we have a four year old daughter. So, um, and I have another full time job. So Monday was the like, don't mess with that day. Uh, but we realized we had to um, do whatever we could to keep as much staff employed as we could and as responsibly as we could and also fill the void that is there now in the neighborhoods of not as many places open and available to provide um, food and, and drink to, to guests. So we jumped in and this past Monday was our first Monday and people came and picked up food. So we're going to keep it going. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, the outreach to the um, to our guests in our newsletter, our most recent newsletter um, that we sent out, um, we announced that all of our gift card sales from now until we're back to normal are going to the staff um, to help kind of fill that payroll void that not all of them are going to get because, you know, we're so slimmed down in our staffing model right now. And so far we've seen um, a huge influx in the mm. online gift card purchases and then little notes that come in with them just saying, you know, I don't even want to use this. I'm just doing it to donate to your staff and we'll come in and pay full price when we're allowed to, et cetera. So we've been um, really taken aback in, in a positive way um, at how that has gone this far. Wow, that's really cool to hear. And uh, it's neat to know that Oaklanders are like showing up in that way. That's really it, cool. Yep, and uh, everyone that comes in and picks up food to go, you know, they've all said, thank you for being open. We know it's hard and we're gonna tell others you're here. So it's um, comforting to know that we're, people see that we're trying to do as, you know, the right thing as, as best we can in these times. Yeah, that, that's really great. Um, Lauren, I, I see you're back on. Um, let's head back to you. Uh, I was asking just briefly about um, Andytown Coffee and if you could share a little bit with the viewers about what Andytown is. We may have to come back to Lauren in another format. Okay. So uh, I'm going to continue the conversation along um, in the spirit of coffee. Peter, <laughs> let's go to you. Um, Peter, you uh, work with the Specialty Coffee Association. I wonder if you could share a little bit about your role and the coffee association's work. Yeah, um, thanks. So um, <clears throat> we're, the Specialty Coffee Association is a, is a group of... Uh, uh, we're a trade association dedicated to the success of the specialty coffee industry. Our sort of motto is make coffee better. So um, uh, that's what we're engaged in, uh, in bringing together the community that um, all the way from producers to coffee shops and baristas um, and the entire chain in between uh, that's engaged in better um, coffee. And so um, we do events and education and uh, also research um, that's to support that work. So I head up the research activities, um, which includes things like scientific research, sensory research, chemistry, all that kind of stuff. But importantly to this conversation, market research. So, mm. um, so we, we do uh, uh, research that's aimed at supporting small businesses. We've collaborated with Square in the past on, 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 uh, on that sort of thing. And, um, and then recently, this week, we, we've been doing some flash polling in our community to try to um, ascertain what the, what the effects of the current situation are on, on, on coffee communities. And so I can share um, some of those things with you. Um, we're talking here a lot about what small businesses are doing um, in, the, in these times. And I've heard a lot already that really resonates with what we heard in the, in the poll which is that the, the companies that are weathering this um, more successfully than others mm -hmm. have done some really important things. Pivoting to online sales, um, uh, shifting into the uh, uh, takeaway or to-go model, really, really assertive communication with mm. customers and uh, vendors and also think people like landlords, you know, real strong communication that came up over and over among the people that were the most optimistic about getting through this um, thing where lots of communication with everybody, the, the whole, uh, the whole web. 
And then finally, experimenting with something that most um, uh, that's kind of unusual in, in specialty coffee, which is delivery. Um, and uh, in, in other words, the shop doing their own delivery, setting up delivery routes, et cetera. Um, I was talking uh, to one in our community, um, Nicholas Cho from Wrecking Ball Coffee, and he said that through trying to innovate in these ways um, and working really hard at it, they were able to get up now to pre-crisis levels, which is oh. astonishing. So um, there is some opportunity here. I love to hear these stories that have already been shared here. Um, and uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of anxiety and suffering out there in the coffee community for sure, but there are these um, uh, uh, opportunities for innovation and, um, and finding ways to, uh, to adapt. Yeah, that's really, that's really inspiring to hear. And it sounds like the pieces around both proactive communication and then also consistent communication really fall into play. Um, outside of sort of that research and sharing component, are there other ways that the Specialty Coffee Association works with small business owners? Yeah, well, I, as I mentioned, education is a big thing um, that we do. So we, um, we, have, uh, we have a network of, uh, of coffee educators that work and we develop curriculums and help them um, do this work. And um, so learning how not only to some business tools, but also things like, you know, how to, how to prepare coffee properly, how to train baristas, how to, um, how to taste coffee, et cetera. That's a big part of the way that we support businesses. Oh, that's really interesting. I know um, one thing, uh, that's really been sought out in our Square Cellar community, I'll talk about that a little later, is that people are also interested in learning at this time. So that's really, that's really interesting. Yeah, uh, we're focusing some efforts right now on, this, on the crisis, but we yeah. are very aware that people are, are eager to take the time that they have at home to learn more and develop themselves. So yeah, yeah we're hearing that too. That's great, that's great to hear, you know, thinking about all sides. Um, I know that you're privy, of course, to how the coffee uh, business is operating across the globe. Um, you've seen it both in good times and in bad. You've seen really interesting insights into places like Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, and in Tokyo, the coffee industry already relies heavily on delivery and on pickup. Um, is there anything that you think the U.S. market could learn from Tokyo? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly something that I've, I've, uh, I've noticed. Uh, delivery is much more common in Asia than it is here um, and is becoming more common in, in Europe as well. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting. Some have taken this opportunity to say, okay, we're gonna figure this out and have started to do things like delivery. And, you know, I, I like the conversation too about curbside service because I'm a, I'm, a, uh, I've got, I'm a parent of young kids and I remember, you know, the kids sleeping in the car and wanting to get some coffee, you know, and things like delivery and, and, uh, and, and curbside service are, really important in other in good times as well yeah. so um so i do think that that's going to have an effect um there and that's that's an innovation i think that we can learn during this time yeah that's really really interesting um i know this is like a little bit predicting the future but when you're thinking about the future of specialty coffee and the industry right now is there anything that you think folks should be thinking about or or that you think will really impact us yeah, well, um, one is that that delivery component. I mean, you know, one of the biggest um, coffee companies in the world, Luckin in China, is based mm -hmm. significantly on on a on a delivery yeah. model. So it can be done. Is 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 something that's important there, and I think that's going to be a big change. I'm a coffee. Besides being a kind of a researcher, I'm I'm a, I'm also a coffee history geek, oh. and so. Um, the thing that I do, you know, one of the things that I've done is look at the 1918-19 pandemic, the influenza pandemic that happened mm -hmm. well over 100 years ago, and what was happening in the coffee trade at that time. And there are some interesting insights. And the one that I'll share with you, though, is that the coffee industry grew dramatically in the in the in the wake of that time. Um, and uh, like like now, restaurants were impacted, coffee shops were in, impacted. Um, uh, the entertainment industry, was, which was all live at that time, was, was very heavily impacted. So there was strong economic impacts. But um, many, uh, in the wake, after things started to come back to normal, coffee came back with very, very strongly. And in fact, there was 
twice as much value created by coffee in 1920 than there had been in 1915. Wow. So that shows you that even in uh, five years when two of them were, were being consumed by the uh, 1918 pandemic, um, uh, there was still growth afterwards. So I think to me, that's a message of hope, you know, that, uh, that it's very likely that, that uh, or at least possible that, uh, that coffee will uh, thrive um, uh, in its way through this situation. No, oh, that's really that's really interesting, and that perspective, that historical perspective, is really an interesting lens when we're considering now and being in an acute moment, right? So, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I believe that Lauren is back on the line via telephone. Lauren, are you here with us? Yes, I swear I know how to use a computer. I really do. <laughs> it's okay, taking me back to my days as a radio DJ. That's it. it feels, yeah, I'm, it feels normal. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I'm a barista. I'm not a. I'm not a technology wizard i swear <laughs> we are all now learning new technologies <laughs> as we yes. learning. i wonder though um would you be able to share with our viewers a little bit about andy town and um what you all do yeah absolutely um so we uh we're we are a coffee roasting company we started six years ago um we actually just had our six year birthday on Sunday. We usually mm -hmm. have like huge block parties and like giveaways and stuff. And it was the most somber, uh, somber birthday we've ever had. Um, but yeah, we are six years old and we bake all of our own, uh, pastries. We have four cafe locations. Uh, we actually have one inside of the square office. So mm -hmm. shout out to all of our squares over there. Um, and we, uh, yeah, we roast and sell to wholesale. Um, and I think when the, when the crisis started and, um, the first place that we saw the hit was in our wholesale department, um, when all of the offices closed. And I think that we're, um, a lot of coffee roasting companies felt that, um, felt that as well. Got it. That's um, that's helpful insight. You know, I know that Andy Town um, has really robust social media, and you all have been communicating regularly on social media, and even a little bit about how you've been supporting the medical community and others. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and kind of how the response and dialogue has been. Yeah. So we. Um uh, about this time last week, I was uh, feeling really hopeless and just kind of like scrolling through Twitter, um, reading all of the horrible news coming out. Um, and I saw a tweet from someone um, who was like, hey, like, wouldn't it be a great idea to buy restaurant takeout and send it to hospitals? Mm -hmm. And they were trying to put together some like big fund, like asking for donations of like $1,000 and this and that. And I looked at that and I was like, I can do that, but I can do that like one cup of coffee at a time. So what I did was um, I created a, a, a page on our website where customers could go on and have one cup of coffee for healthcare professionals. Mm. So um, what the website, um, what that program is doing is like it's, keeping us in business because people are still buying coffee. Um, but the coffee that they're buying isn't going to them. It's going to a hospital. Um, so like this time last week, like I had to, you know, reduce my hours for uh, 45 people um, where they were just no longer on the schedule. And it was like looking pretty, pretty bleak. Um, and this program and the, the revenue that it's provided us has allowed us to add back um, about five five employees right now. Um, so it's it's really like saving us um, in, in many ways. Um, and it's also allowing us, like my favorite part about this is that now we get to spend our days like delivering coffee and pastries to hospitals. And that's like the most amazing um, gift that our customers have given us is that we get to really brighten people's days. Um, the right now, the the people that we're delivering to, they're working like 12, 15 hour days, and they're not able to leave the facility. And even if they could leave, the, all the restaurants nearby them are closed. 
So there's really not a lot of food and um, coffee options for hospital workers right now. So when we show up with our, you know, hundred scones and like jugs of coffee, they're like so stoked. And so it's really great that our customers are able to, to let us do that. That's really incredible. And when you think about the direct call to community, that's bridging everyone. So often people are saying, how can I help? And you're giving a tangible way to step up to the plate. Yeah, it's been cool. So like we've been, we started this a week ago and um, since then we've gotten like, I've gotten uh, so far seven different um, coffee shops or other restaurants who have started a similar program. Um, Escape from New York Pizza delivered 60 pizzas to hospitals yesterday. Um, and they were, they credit us for, the, for their, uh, for their idea. Pizza is like a perfect, a perfect use for this idea too. Um, and we've seen it in uh, uh, Denver, Nashville, Paris, um, Washington, D.C. Coffee shops are doing this um, and they're, they're tagging us on, on social media, which I think is really cool. Um, yeah. That's really, really, really neat. Um, I wonder, too, you know, you've, it sounds like some of the adjustments made your business are because of this program. I'm curious just how you've adjusted in other ways, and then how are you communicating that out to your customers? Um, Instagram is our main um, form of communication. We also use um, the newsletter uh, tool on Square. Um, and uh, it's been pretty amazing just engaging with people because we have to, so our, the way that we're doing this um, coffee delivery is like, so people can donate as little as one cup of coffee. But when we go to a hospital, we're bringing upwards of a hundred servings um, to the, to the units. Um, so we're getting people who inquire and they're like, Hey, I'm a nurse. And I get to, you know, message them on Instagram and set up a delivery um, and then on the other side, we have customers that are like, you know, really stoked to help us where they're like, hey, I really wanted to help you out, but I didn't want any coffee in my house or I didn't want to like leave my house to go to your cafe and buy something. So this is a really cool way um, for them to, to feel like they're to, to actually be helping us and also the healthcare professionals who are working really hard. Wow, thank you for sharing that. That's that's really interesting. And I know we'll come back in a little bit about other ways that um, maybe people's models have changed or shifted. Um, now I'm going to take it to Julie. Um, now that we're in a place in terms of thinking about recovery and thinking about next steps. Um, Julie, I wonder if you would share a little bit about what the Small Business Administration does and its work. Okay, thank you, Erin. Thank you to Square for this platform. And I'm enjoying hearing the stories of our fellow panelists as well. But um, a Small Business Administration, SBA, for people who aren't familiar with us, um, in normal conditions, we kind of offer services and programming in, in um, three major buckets. So there's, of course, financial assistance, everything from microfinancing all the way up to venture capital. Mm -hmm. uh, we also help people who are interested in breaking into federal government contracting and have programs to help them get their way in and grow their business that way. And then also our, our technical assistance, if you will, free business advising, yes, free business advising and low and no cost training programs. And so that's kind of our, our bread and butter, if you will, of programs and services. And we have a fourth bucket, mm -hmm. which is uh, one that we, we don't like to have to tap into, but we're glad it's there. And that's our disaster assistance, which I know is what we're, we're here to talk today about as well. Yeah, I think timely and um, people are hearing a lot in the news about the SBA and that that's part of, you know, they're hearing this, all the political pieces that are rolling out. But um, tactically, I've known the SBA for a really long time. And um, I know that specifically the dedication to disaster recovery and relief comes in many forms. Specifically, I wonder if you'd be able to share, and I'm going to say this slowly, this is like the take notes part, um, about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Would you be able yes, to share Very that? good. Very good. Um, and because we're government and we reduce everything to an acronym, we can just call it uh, IDLE. <laughs> so yeah. IDLE Loan Program. And this is a program, um, you know, we come in all the time and people don't even realize it when there's 
what we consider a more traditional disaster like the wildfires or a hurricane and and we provide all types of lending assistance it, so this is a program that we've had we're just we've retooled it and tweaked it to fit this scenario we're in now um, of a virus a pandemic and so it allows businesses to get low interest loans directly from sba um, and it's to help with working capital needs for any business that's been impacted somehow financially by COVID-19. So this is um, a great way to get help you um, get some income, some funding, I should say, uh, to help pay your financial obligations that you have. Like these are your ordinary business expenses like rent and mm -hmm. payroll and maybe accounts payable any of your ordinary business expenses that, you know, under normal conditions you could afford, but right now because of the impact of COVID-19 and your, on your revenue stream, you know, you might be struggling to pay. Or, in, you know, in some instances, businesses have had to close altogether. And so this could help them get through that period of time. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, I'm wondering who should apply for this? So if you are a small business, uh, you should apply. This program is open to, it's now open across the entire country. It's a national declaration. Any small business and our definition of small business is very generous. For example, if you're a, a full service restaurant, um, our size standard allows you to have up to $8 million and that's an average annual sales over three years and you're still considered small. So I always tell people you, you probably are small <laughs> by our size standards and you should apply. This program allows you to get up to $2 million at a fixed rate of 3.75%. And there are no fees attached to that. There's no points or closing costs that you would normally see in a loan. It's just the straight interest rate. And we will defer payments for right now we're deferring about 12 months. Or maybe longer so it's a way to get an infusion of working capital and that you can um you know work on debt service later oh and the term can go up to 30 years too so it's uh it's fairly generous in in the way it's structured that way yeah that's that's really helpful to understand all of the parameters and things that go into it now how can someone apply for this loan so that is a great thing too, because of our social distancing practices right now, we are 100% online. So the mm -hmm. program is available online, you can apply online, um, and, and they will send you the closing documents and do everything virtually. So, so you don't have to make a trip out to go visit your SBA district office or anyone else, we can do it all virtually. Um, there's also a way to download paper forms if you, if you don't wanna apply online and you can mail those in, you can email, even except fax. I don't know if anybody has fax machines anymore, but we can even fax in your application. <laughs> Very flexible. <laughs> yes. Everything um, short of, you know, carrier pigeon. So yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, is there anything that um, folks would need to apply or could they go review how they might prepare? Sure. There's um, you can see an overview if you go onto the web portal and um, it's easy to find the web portal. You just need to remember SBA.gov, G-O-V, and there's a bright yellow banner at the top that'll take you right into the disaster portal. You can download all the forms if you just wanna see what they look like and what information they ask for before you do the online version. It's pretty streamlined. It's, your, it's the basic application to learn a little bit more about you and your business. Um, we're gonna ask um, for, it's an IRS form 4506T, which just authorizes us to look at your tax returns for the last couple of years. And uh, then there's also the statement of liabilities, which is your chance to demonstrate to us what your you know monthly expenses look like, how much you're spending and to whom and what you owe. So that gives us a good sense of what your financial need mm -hmm. is. And then we can project out for you know several months um, to try to cover you through this period of time. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me, well, like, how do I know how much money I need? You know, we don't, mm -hmm. we don't really have an end date, unfortunately, for this. It's, it's everyone's best guess right now. The one thing I'm telling people is, don't, um, we will, we understand this is uh, a, a different scenario, a lot of unknowns, and you can always come back to SBA and request more funding if, you know, three months from now, things haven't gotten back to a state that you're getting a more regular you know, revenue flow or you're back to quote normal, you can come back and ask to amend the loan and to get more money. As long as you haven't hit the 2 million cap yet. 
Yeah. Oh, that's really helpful. And I'm going to very slowly call out. So for viewers on, at home who are jotting this down, it's sba.gov. Um, is there anything else that folks should think about or consider? Um, I think, you know, sometimes people are a little leery about getting a loan, especially in a time of uncertain financial um, structure right now. But I would say if, if you have been financially impacted, please apply. This is a program that has very low interest rate. Um, it goes and you can amortize the debt over 30 years and you can defer payments for, you know, 12 months or so. And so it really behooves you to apply. And I, you know, my parting line for most people is like, please don't just qualify yourself by not even mm -hmm. applying. And it doesn't take too long and you probably have almost of the information and documents on hand already. So please spend a, an hour or two and fill out the application and send it in. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to take us to a little bit of a roundtable discussion as we're um, coming toward the end. I think that um, one of the things that you've all touched on, each one of you, has touched on businesses keeping their brands alive, both in short term and in long term. And I wonder if there's any advice that you might have um, for fellow business owners in terms of communicating, keeping that brand out there. How do you connect at this time? I'll open up the floor. Yeah, uh, I'll hop in. Um, you know, I want first. I want to second a lot of what uh, uh, a lot of other people said. Um, you know, we similar to uh, to you uh, over at Andy Coffee, we released a product called uh, COVID Rescue Packs, which is a three pack reheatable meal that someone else can buy for the most vulnerable populations in Nashville. Um, so similar to the cup of coffee for the health uh, industry, this is three meals prepackaged so that people can reheat them. And I bring that up, one, because I think that's a great idea, um, what you're doing with the healthcare field. But this is the type of thing that's actually, this is one of those things that I'm, I'm realizing that we'll probably continue on doing, right? There's, um, there's always vulnerable people and... Um, at least in Nashville, but I think it's nationwide, people are always looking for ways to help. So one way that we're keeping our brand alive right now is by creating space for people who are quarantined at home to actually continue helping and serving the community. And um, that is something that I think that will probably evolve and continue doing um, you know, into the future. Um, this product we launched on Monday, it's been successful enough that on this coming Monday, we'll be serving 300 meals to the most vulnerable people in, in Nashville. Wow. Uh, and all the while that's money coming through our door so that we can keep our staff out of the vulnerable population. Um, and so, you know, the way we did that was by over communicating. So we, um, starting last week, uh, I've been personally writing an email to our, uh, to our email database as well as our socials, um, every day. And, our goal has been to stay connected and to actually provide um, hope in a time where there's a lot of fear. So we've been turning outward, trying to provide people with uh, information, but also, um, you know, hey, don't forget that like there is a, there is an end to this, and we don't want to um, we don't want to let fear and anxiety overtake us. So we can stay we can stay connected through technology, and then here's a way to help, and then here's this survival pack that will help you, you know, have a good meal or whatever it is. Um, but for us, for our brand, um, our motto is do unto others. So for us, you know, we've been trying to find ways to help others do unto others uh, through this process. And the feedback has been really good. That's really incredible. Um, anyone else with thoughts on how your model might change or how you might adapt in the future? That's really interesting and that call out to community is really present. Um, how about, I'm curious from all of you because I know in the small business community, we look to one another all the time for resources, for ideas. Who else out there is inspiring you right now or is doing something that you're curious to, to check out and try? Well, I'll just say from my point as an observer, um, and I was a, I was a, when I worked in the trade, I, I, I'm just inspired by 
all of these stories of uh, creative adaptation to the situation. Um, this has come up a lot, you know, and, and it's uh, this idea of pantry staples, you know, coffee shops being being a source for those sorts of of items and and being okay with uh, changing the model here, you know. And I think um, those are the things that inspire me about coffee in general. I've worked in coffee a long time. Uh, um, this is my thirty first year in coffee, so I've seen coffee adapt over over time and watching it happen really fast. Um, is is I think really important and and really good and I think um, it would just watching that watching you know coffee has this important role coffee shops and restaurants have these really important roles as as anchor points for the community and what I'm hearing is in this time when we can't be physical anchor points for the community we can still be um, strong entities within our communities using com other communication media and stuff. So, so anyway, I think that's also a really powerful role that our, our, our businesses can have. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else seeing uh, things where you're seeing community come together online in new ways or um, interesting ideas from other business owners? Uh, this, is, this is Corey. I'll say uh, for Oakland, we, back in 20, um, 2012, um, started the Oakland Indie Alliance, when, mm -hmm. which back then was a group of a few restaurants trying to figure out how to adapt to the quickly changing minimum wage laws without a lot of notice. Um, and since then that has grown, that from then went to, hey, I need a painter, does somebody have someone they really trust? Or, hey, I have an extra line cook who wants some more shifts and, um, now they've expanded and that includes all or a lot of small businesses in Oakland and um, just what everyone is doing and collaborating with online right now just is a it's a powerful sounding board for those of us that are wanting to do more mm -hmm. or are maybe in doubt of some of the ideas we have and then bouncing it off of, of like-minded individuals um, it, it's just it's a comforting uh, now more than ever that there are other people. I mean, you, we all know that we're, everyone's going through this, but um, those in similar lights to us to um, talk about all this and come up with the best ideas we can. Um, well, and the, as much as possible, not stepping on each other's toes and trying to, you know, do the same thing in multiple places. Yeah, that's that's really interesting too. Is like this idea of collaborating and then also being careful, um, but not even being physically proximal. So I think that is really real. Um, I know we're getting close to time. I want to give each of you a challenge, a quick one, a lightning round. Um, just one word of advice, or maybe it's two or three words. Totally fine. But just a quick word of advice for any small business owner who's tuning in right now. And we can just go any order. Feel free to pipe in. Uh, I would just say, uh, even, even though it feels like a desperate time, try not to make it about you. Mm -hmm. Try to make it about your community. That's what's going to matter most to them. I would say you're at the hardest point right now. I think um, for, for me, it's just, taking it one day at a time and um, always looking at my son has been watching a lot of frozen two lately. And I keep repeating, do the next right thing, which is a song in frozen two. For those of you who don't have four, four year olds. <laughs> um, some, a, a phrase came to my head when I was listening to some of the people talk. And I think it's so important. It's something that I also as a consumer appreciate so much is this idea of you know sort of alliterative keep communicating compassionately i think i think mm -hmm. i'm seeing you know people act and and in with compassion and that's so important at this time and and um so yeah that's my great and julie um i would just say that this is a very scary and lonely feeling time 
but you don't have to do it alone. We still have SBAs open for business and all of our resource providers. Those, those free business advisors are there by phone and email to support you. So you have some tough decisions ahead of you or you want to just bounce your next crazy idea off them and see if you can find something that works. Please reach out to us because we're really here to try to support you and get you through this really challenging time. That's great. And with all these messages of support, I just, I want to say thank you to our panelists and thank you for taking the time you're sharing your expertise, um, your experience, and we're so grateful for you and we'll be following all of your journey journeys. Uh, for our viewers tuning in, if you have questions or would like to connect with fellow business owners, please visit sellercommunity.com. You can also find more information about future discussions like these and other webinars and trainings there. Um, and you can find the Square Resource Hub at squareup.com. So thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciative for all of you. And um, thank you and goodbye from all of us. Thank you for having us. <laughs>